Hi everybody, welcome to week three. Um, this week is a pretty light unit of content. We'll be discussing the role of the bedside nurse. We have some interactive case studies for you. Um, we'll talk briefly about eye song and the role of the genetics nurse, which is a specialized role. And we'll talk about DNA testing and forensic nursing. So the role of the bedside nurse, why every nurse needs to have uh, some background in genetics. Genetics nurses have specialized training. That's a separate subgroup of nurses, but every nurse needs to have a role in this age of genomics. Um, for one thing, collecting family medical history is very important. Every disease is has some genetic connection. Um, when you get that family medical history, look for clues in that family history that might signal genetic problems or if a person has symptoms of a disease that has a genetic component, you know, it's good to ask more questions about that. Your role is also to provide accurate information and you need to have the accurate information and able to provide it. The case studies we'll go through, we'll kind of make it a little uh, more, put them in a little more context. Um, but then you have to know how to refer people to a genetic professional. When you see something that is highly genetic, you need to know who the right person is. Um, you are to serve as a patient advocate. I have a case study that will talk about that. Um, and your role is also to maintain confidentiality. Anytime uh, genetic information could be used as uh, inappropriately against somebody <clears throat> to discriminate, for example. And also, as a nurse, you are a source of credible health information to many, many people, including your family, your friends, people you come into contact with. They may have questions on any number of health issues, and some of them will include genetic or genomic knowledge. As genetic testing sort of takes off and becomes more important in healthcare, <clears throat> and we'll kind of integrate that into you know several weeks' worth of content, um, it's going to be important for you to be able to explain why certain screenings are more necessary for people or why genetic testing could benefit someone who's on psychiatric medication, for example. Uh, but you do have that role. So we'll do some case studies. I'm going to start with Lisa. She's so cute. Lisa is 19. She's a freshman studying biology. You're the nurse caring for her 15-year-old brother, Will, who has cystic fibrosis. William has had a lot of hospital stays on your pediatric pulmonary unit, so you've had a lot of contact with Lisa and you've developed a good relationship with her. One afternoon, Lisa sees you in the hallway and asks if you have a moment to talk with her privately. <clears throat> this happens to be a good time, so you find a private place and sit down. Now Lisa confides in you that she just discovered that she is pregnant. She is concerned that the baby will have cystic fibrosis. Lisa tells you, the father of the baby is not involved, she doesn't think she can handle a child with severe illness at this time in her life, and she has not told her parents that she's pregnant, and she has not yet seen a provider for prenatal care, but she's coming to you because you are a nurse and you are trustworthy and you know a lot about cystic fibrosis. So she asks you, what are the odds that my baby has cystic fibrosis? Well, we know from last week that autosomal, autosomal recessive disorders tend to be heritable in certain patterns. So let's see what the accurate response is here. Number one, the odds are 50% that your child will be a carrier and 50% that your child will have the disease. Number two, both you and the baby's father would have to be tested to see if you are cystic fibrosis carriers to know the chances of your baby having CF. Number three, since you have no symptoms of CF, it's not possible to have a child with CF, cystic fibrosis. Or number four, this disorder happens because of faulty duplication during meiosis. You are not at increased risk for passing on the disease. So take some time and answer that little question in Edpuzzle. The correct option was number two, cystic fibrosis it has, is due to a recessive allele on the CFTR gene. An individual has inherited one allele from a cystic fibrosis variant from each parent. Lisa's parents are both carriers. We don't know what Lisa's status is. We see her phenotype as asymptomatic, but her odds of being a carrier are 50%. If both she and the father of the baby are carriers, the odds of the fetus being affected with cystic fibrosis are 25%. But without testing, it's difficult to predict the chances that this child will have the disease. Now, there is another option. It used to be that amniocentesis, CVS, 
um, non-invasive prenatal testing really screened mostly for chromosomal disorders because those are the easiest to see in a karyotype. But newer genetic testing can now isolate certain genes <clears throat> and look for those alleles that have you know, the trait for the disease. Um, it's a little more expensive. It's a little more complicated to do it. The procedure is the same for the patient, um, but it is available at 10 weeks gestation for CBS and NIPS testing. Um, Lisa seems a little confused about this, and she knows she's running out of time to make a decision. So you ask her what she understands about cystic fibrosis, and she tells you all she knows is what she's seen her brother go through, and she knows that it's familiar runs in families. So who would you direct her to? And take a minute to answer that. Lisa reveals that her last menstrual period was about eight weeks ago. She tells you that she'll probably keep the baby if she knows that it's healthy, but that she will probably terminate the pregnancy if testing reveals that it has cystic fibrosis. She tells you that testing the father of the baby is not an option because he will not answer her phone calls or return her text messages. Well, so she asks you about the options for fetal testing, insurance coverage, whether she'll re obtain results in time to secure an abortion if they're positive for cystic fibrosis. <clears throat> so in this scenario, if this conversation became disturbing to you because of your personal values, how would you reconcile the conflict? How could you respect your own beliefs and values and still support this patient? And I'm not going to leave that Ned puzzle. I'm just going to let you kind of examine your feelings on the issue. All right. So after examining your feelings about the subject, you realize that the factual information about Lisa's question is outside your area of expertise. So now we're back to who do we refer her to? Um, and I'll let you ponder that as well. I won't make it a question in Edpuzzle because I know you already had one. So we're going to go to Michael. Michael is our next uh, case study. Michael has Marfan syndrome, and you can see from the photograph, he is very tall, very thin, has very long limbs. Michael's 34-year-old man living with Marfan syndrome. Marfan syndrome is an autosomal dominant disorder that involves connective tissue and varies in expression from mild to severe heart disease and skeletal deformities. Um, so variable expression means that maybe Michael's not severely affected or maybe he's moderately affected, but that his offspring could be either mildly affected if it gets that dominant allele or it could be very severely impacted. <clears throat> so individuals with this disorder are typically tall and thin and have long limbs and fingers. Michael's a friend and he values your expertise as a nurse. He tells you that he and his wife would like to have another child. Their two-year-old child son was conceived unexpectedly, has no features of Marfan syndrome. Michael has no family history of Marfan's and was told by geneticists that his case was caused by a de novo mutation, and we'll learn more about those when we study mutations. The trait for Marfan's is autosomal dominant. <clears throat> he wants to know what this means for him. And he tells you he'd love to have another baby, but he's terrified of passing on this gene. He's already had two orthopedic surgeries and one cardiac procedure, and he might need more. Um, and he knows it could be even more serious in a child. He's considering all his options, including pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, adoption, use of donor sperm, and remaining a one-child family. So which statement reflects the best understanding of autosomal dominant inheritance when a parent is heterozygous for the trait and the other parent does not have the gene variant? One, all offspring spring will have the disorder since it is dominant. Two, there's a 25% chance of having a child with the disorder, a 50% chance of having a child who is a carrier, and a 25% chance of having a child who is not affected. Choice three, there is a 50% chance that any natural conception, meaning not pre-implantation diagnosis or you know anything that would interfere, 50% chance would result in a child who has Marfan's disorder. <clears throat> and choice number four, if a couple already has a child with an autosomal dominant disorder, their second child will be fine because only 50% of their children will have the disease. All right, use what you learned last week to answer this question. So the correct option here is three. Half of Michael's gametes will contain the gene responsible for Morphan syndrome. It's dominant, so when it's present, its traits will be expressed. 
If it's not present, the individual, the offspring is unaffected. <clears throat> there are no carriers when you have autosomal dominance. So please, if you are discussing other autosomal dominant diseases like Huntington's, do not describe people as carriers. There are no carriers for Marfan's, no carriers for Huntington's. Any individual who has the gene will have the disease. The presence or absence of disease in an older sibling has no bearing on an individual's risk. Every conception is a new toss of the coin. It does not know whether you got heads or tails last time. All right, we're gonna take a break here. We'll come back and we'll do two more case studies. And then we'll talk about ISONG and forensic genetics. <laughs>